Hello and welcome to What We're Watching. It's Catherine. It's Liz. And Ed. And John. So let's talk about, I think everybody's watching it or finished watching it, mm. House of the Dragon. Yes. I mean, they did not take their time on that. They like got right through a whole bunch of stuff. They didn't drag it on. Oh, oh. they didn't drag All it right, on. All right, we should okay. say spoiler alerts because just the season finale just aired yeah, yeah, last yeah. Sunday. Mm-hmm. So if you are not totally caught up, maybe fast forward through this section. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, we need to talk about some stuff. All right. So I um, was shocked that it was already over. Ten yeah. episodes went so fast, right? And especially for not bingeable, that right. it was once a week. And I think I watched it. I don't think I let anything pile up. It was pretty much... I let a dragon pile of oh, a geez. horde up and watch them all at once. It was fine. It's great. Just okay. wait, wait them out. Wait them out. I we, can't watch 10 episodes of anything in a row at this point. It's too much commitment. Yes. Agree. But two or three, you know, but yeah, no. sometimes you accidentally skip a week or whatever. Yeah, yeah. We, I think we pretty much kept up on it. John, do you remember? John came over and watched it with us. Yeah, we were, we were on top of it. Yeah. There's some other things that we've let slide a bit, but we were on top of House of the Dragon. Yeah. And this is the prequel to Game of Thrones. Correct. Um, which is all based on the books or the lore of uh, George R. R. Martin's. Right. Right. But did John, did he actually write House of Dragons? I feel like because you've read some of those books. Yeah, I mean, I'm paused. I haven't read all of them. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was just reminded, apparently, uh, not in preparation for the series, but they sort of timed out together. He did do sort of a Targaryen history book. Uh, oh. So I don't know how much dealt with this period, but there is some. There's maybe not endless. Okay. All right, so 10 episodes, we had a big finale, some people died. I gotta say, poor Patty Considine, who was playing, spoiler alert, the king, he's dead. Oh my, well, how did, he was rotting for the, I like, mean, the last six episodes. So I don't incredibly know how he was alive. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, like, basically didn't address it. Ugh, that's stupid, not addressing things in this franchise it's very frustrating what do you mean not address it like um, what was wrong with him yeah well and the previous entire franchise of game of thrones they they kind of let some stuff just hang out there you're like well, what about the faceless men nothing don't worry about <laughs> just it just kidding <laughs> they're faceless <laughs> ah! so i feel like there there will be some unsolved mysteries in this series well definitely the king's character like what was going on with him uh i don't know but just seem to be the times, yeah. man. You got an infection, you were screwed. And, you know, leeches and worms, or like all their treatments were just herbs. I mean, it was just gross. I, I think for me, it was like, I, I didn't stop watching uh, the series, but it was like, oh, well, I'm going to just wait until you put it all together for me. Because this slowly unraveling of the king is now he's just got a dangling, swooping <laughs> sleeve and you haven't said anything. <laughs> His arm's gone. Oh my, I, I gotta wait. I gotta wait. You gotta give me like four episodes to watch. I mean, the reveal when he had like a big <laughs> hole in his cheek and a missing eye, I was like, oh, well, well this is getting really good. It was like bad. Phantom of yeah. the Opera. We took yeah, that off. Yeah, because he had that like, mask oh, on. Lord. Yeah. Ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. yeah, so uh, uh, that was a slow, gross death. But then yeah. we had the real shot. I love him as an actor. Oh, yes. Fantastic. He's fantastic. Yeah. Man, he tried to bring that family together. I know. He was really the patient patriarch that you want right yeah well i mean with spoilers and so i won't do the full version but i mean he did bring them together Mm -hmm. though then does he get the blame for them falling apart yeah yes because in his mm, you know (laughs) final moments final moments of death dreaming the queen i definitely think misinterpreted what he said Mm -hmm. to her advantage classic Mm -hmm. yeah so classic is, yeah. deathbed misunderstanding. Whoopsie! Ugh. I because, mean, if it were a sitcom, ha ha ha! Because this is really all about you know who will reign after his death. Because you know you don't have a male heir, it was problematic, and so his daughter Renera is who he names, and that is just seems to be an issue the entire time. Right, because then when he has male heirs later, he still sticks with Rhaenyra, and she knows the secret, which is what he kind of alluded to when he was dying that confused the queen. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, John. No, correct. Keep going. (laughs) I also felt like, you know, the secret wasn't that... Am I wrong? It didn't feel like that dire. It was like, 
I know you have to pass it on to leader to leader, right? I mean, you're supposed to know that there's a time. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, it seems lightweight because, oh, well, it's just, oh, eventually there'll be a threat. But in actuality, if you were, like, trying to prepare for it, it would be more serious. Yeah. And then I also think what they were trying to do, I think, was show, like, oh, well, even worrying about this future seems silly currently. So that can't be our motivation. Exactly. Although now, oh. we did see like an entire reign of a king from the beginning to the end of this uh, season. We saw mm -hmm. his entire reign. I don't know. We're giving like what forty years. Let's call let's call it forty years. Uh, he looked a thousand years old by the time he died because he was <laughs> yeah. It's hard to tell how old he was supposed completely to be. unraveled. But I'm just wondering, like, okay, so five more kings? That's not that big of a secret to hold. For like well, five more dudes to hold on to it until actually, oh, actually the wall, actually there's some frozen people is bad. But the current, we don't want to do a spoiler alert, but, you know, Renera is told the secret and that's an issue because if you don't take actually the reign, you know, of the whole realm, you, then uh, that current person doesn't know the secret. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I will say we thought episode two, you know, the crab feeder, the sea snake battle, that character was gross, and yeah. you thought, wow, he's really going to be something. Yeah, apparently not. No, he we was like a crab cocktail yeah. very quickly. It was the like, crab dude this? was a red herring. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> and I mean, I just love, you know, the character played by Matt Smith, you know, Damon. Sure. What a jerk. Oh, he's, yeah, he's really he's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he takes out the like crab feeder sea snake in a way that you're like, how did that happen? How well, did he just you totally did it? What do you yeah. mean? It's fine. And listen, the age, I will say, because they start with Renera, Princess Renera, young, played by a different actress, kind of what they do in The Queen, right? So started off. I guess she was supposed to be 14, which seemed like not really, but okay. Yes. Well, you know, in Hollywood, in case you don't know, they didn't actually want a 14 year old to play that part for various reasons, including child labor laws. That yeah, but would... then it's confusing to watch because you're like, how old is she supposed to be? She looks well, like listen, she's 20. The ages went yeah. everywhere on this thing. Certain people did not age at all, like at all. Yeah, Olivia Cook, who played the queen, the older version of the queen, as Patty Considine's character of the king is like rotting into his 80s. She's like still looking like the she's, same. yeah, 30. Like what? I don't I understand. Do I invented it in this and time. And then she has <laughs> <laughs> these two kids who are married to each other. Uh, gross. Um, yeah, and they're like well, 20 something. The incest thing is, uh, you know. It's real strong in this it's show. Real it's real strong. strong. It's a real theme. Yeah, so there was a lot of characters actually that just, you know, Sir Christian never really seemed to age. Neither Sir Harold. I mean, there were certain people, Otto barely. You know, the, the high tower, the hand, that evil jerk. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's just certain people that you were like, yeah, the king drastically aged. The two main female leads, they became completely different actresses. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. So, you know, and then I could not follow the king's second family kids. It was like, how were you toddlers last week? And you are like disgruntled teenagers this week like what is happening you know, yeah that, same with uh, yeah i was just gonna say same with renera's kids i was like which one is the older one oh, which one is the thank and God then one of them had a big scar in their eye to keep track of him <laughs> no, no no that's the oh. king's kids <laughs> renera's kids not are Rhaenyra's the kids. the brown hair kids, kids right, because yeah. they're not real oh sorry they're not really her kids the uh, well they're her kids but they're not because her if you kids. don't have that super blonde white hair i mean we know what their last name should be. You're not Targaryen. It should be Snow. Oh, Whoa. yeah, it should be Snow. Uh, I did want to make a joke. What, John? <laughs> well, that would be if they were born in the North. By the way, nine generations in between. Nine okay. generations. Okay. Substantial. Um, I was just going to make a light comment that this might be the first series that Matt Smith has ever been involved in where other actors are completely getting swapped out around him for the exact same character. Usually, he <laughs> plays that character as Doctor yeah. Who. Oh, that's Doom. funny. <laughs> and actually, uh, uh, the Queen, he played the first age progression, Queen Elizabeth's future Prince husband Philip, and yeah. Prince Philip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean... So yes, the age uh, swapping characters and actors out for age, you know, aging up is something he's used to, although he just stayed the same. And, you know, he is um, ruthless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he had some of the better shocking moments of like, oh, 
Oh, whoa. Also, he was young enough not to age out, even though he was a sibling of the king. So he could have turned into a thousand year old pile of bones. <laughs> um, but he's probably going to be in next season. They didn't immediately kill him at the end of the season. So looking yeah, spoiler forward, alert, spoiler yeah. alert, looking yeah. forward to some of the characters that didn't die, even though I hate all of them. I do <laughs> really like that they kind of explained the relationship or how someone becomes a dragon rider. Because in Game of Thrones, it wasn't as clear because they were basically all gone. I mean, right. so this was really the reign of the dragons. Like, if you were Targaryen, you know, it's almost your birthright. And you would have a dragon and egg. And you would have a dragon egg. But then if that dragon egg doesn't hatch, you're kind of out of luck. Which that was crazy. That one story arc that happened with Aemond. Is that the one with the patch? Yes. Yeah. How he originally didn't seem to be able to control or have his own dragon. And boy, he pulls a move that yeah, was... He gets uh, the big scary dragon. Which gives yeah. him a mm-hmm. pair of balls that is really, you know, doesn't uh, shrink anytime yeah. after that. One eye, but... Some T-Rexes yeah. and he's on like a flying brontosaurus. Like, hey guys! <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that was the scene in this finale where you see the two dragons go at it in the sky and you're like, oh, yeah, his dragon is humongous and this young guy is on a real tiny dragon. You're in trouble, dude. And and spoiler, it does not end well. Of course not. I mean, well, because really, you realize in the age of dragons has been wiped out in Game of Thrones. So how did that happen? Dragons had to fight dragons. Yeah, dragons had to kill each other. So, yeah. you know, there were moments, once again, very dark, just the way they lit it. They're yeah. mm-hmm. Now, it was the same cinematographer who chose in Game of Thrones to make the, you know, that huge battle. What was the battle called, John? The Long Night. Yeah. Well, that was the name of the episode. <laughs> Which literally, night. But his whole thing was like, well, I want to have it look like what would be the natural lighting. <laughs> but you're at home going like, I can't see shit. Yeah. <laughs> so there were a couple moments that, you know, but there were warnings because people got outraged. And, you know, I was watching it like the next day. And it was like, turn the brightness up on your TV to see it. <laughs> it's like, okay. Well, I thought this episode was better. I forget which one, like two episodes back, there was a scene on the beach that looked horrendous. I mean, I think they shot it day for night and then they color corrected it all weird and like, we thought our TV was broken. We were like, what is happening? We didn't, And of course, my husband was like, let's get a new TV. I'm like, hold your horses. I knew that that was what we were getting was what we were supposed to be getting. And it was fine. But it looked awful. Yeah. Well, anyway, the Internet really went bananas. Pushed back yeah, on it. They were like, hey, Again, hold yeah. on. Not everybody has whatever screens you're color correcting on in your post-production house or whatever. So make sure we can see it at home. The point is that you can't see it. They're trying to say, oh, look, there's almost no light, so you can't see it. Well, yeah. It's as if you're there. Okay. I mean, I still thought it was beautifully shot. The CGI was great. I actually felt it easier to follow than Game of Thrones because this is a lot of like origin stories and because the names in some way. They're all just all over each other. It would be like if in Game of Thrones they had met up in the first season and then they were just on top of each other being total not spread jerks, out as opposed to geography they didn't wise. Until the seventh season yeah she didn't even get to westeros practically well i think what you're both basically saying is uh we're dealing with a much smaller focus and much right smaller exactly cast of mm-hmm. character so i mean it made it more enjoyable for myself just to be able to follow it and i also the names were familiar enough and you felt like you kind of had the vernacular or you saw where this might be going. You're like, okay, all right. Although the look of the costumes and just even the environment and the mm-hmm. cities did not feel like nine generations, you're saying, John, had passed to when we caught up with Game of Thrones. It felt like... It feels the same, kind it, of, yeah. It felt similar enough. Well, I mean, yeah, I think in some ways it was supposed to feel slightly different. I think it did. Mm-hmm. But you're going from one portion of like medieval type history to another. It's not supposed to I change. want advancements. <laughs> you, also have to, you also have to think that like what they're losing in this series that we know that they lose everything. That entire family, that entire franchise of like lives, stories, everything is gone. They're they're wrapped. They get they get cut out of history. Yeah. I mean, they basically wiped themselves out. But 
what I found was fascinating was the king, basically his dying wish was like, we are stronger if we are a family and we stick together. And really, it was not outside forces that destroyed them. It was internal strifes. It was internal jealousy. I mean, friggin' Hightower is the, that hand, my son would be like, ah, shut him up. Because he just so wanted his lineage, his son, to take over. It was like at all costs. And that was willing to like, kill family members over it yeah. like insane so it wasn't so much outer forces you know it was the internal family jealousies and positioning that destroyed them so i mean it is coming back for a second season right oh yeah i mean yeah yeah uh, yeah yeah I, I did just see an article at the end of uh the imdb page that says it'll be back in not in 2023 24 yeah i know classic it's, oh yeah classic uh, anyway, hbo so two years show. from now yeah how they is that aging what? will be, It'll be a hot season of eight episodes i mean probably well listen the production value and they are all an hour about an hour long each that is a lot to produce yeah it's an expensive show yeah i do want to give a shout out to eve best who plays princess rainies she was supposed to be yeah, the one who was never queen or whatever yeah. they call her. Mm -hmm. God, she's great. Uh, I mean, yeah. the scene in episode seven. Uh -huh. I mean, it reminded me a little bit of Gringotts when, <laughs> you know, Ron, Harry and Hermione came up with the dragon and kind of surprised everybody so yeah there was a little bit of that but mm -hmm. i mean i was no, like no we're not even yes i was like girl you had your moment you could have righted the course yeah it was right interesting then. that she didn't yeah uh, a little hot breath from that dragon could have changed everything man i mean look she was actually doing the right thing what this season was all about is in fighting your right it's peacetime yeah. there are a lot of people who could be rulers and we're gonna fight each other seems stupid but that's what's happening mm. um so she was trying not to fight which apparently you don't like I just well I don't know if it's gonna work because now there's still gonna be everybody fighting but. yeah it's you know, it's not gonna work <laughs> yeah, otherwise why you know what where, where where is the story gonna go I know but she was such a badass though like I'm just gonna flop in here oh, I'm a dragon so good make a statement and then get out I don't know I, I mean, thought it was great kill a couple hundred peasants what's the big deal I know it that's like the why couldn't whatever? that tail swipe up there on the throne on the dais yes mm -hmm. come on no there was a lot of great actors i i mean i thought the casting was really good with some recognizable faces and then faces like the emma darcy who played princess renera i didn't know who she was i thought she was great she's amazing i mean yeah. she did have a really horrible arc the end of this yeah, season but... where she lost her baby spoiler alert easy day also I then... mean, and then go right to the big table and discuss some more stuff because you're now the queen and I liked, um, you know, Olivia Cook, who played the actual queen. I liked her in Ready Player One. Um, yeah, she's she had, great. She had a great arc in Bates Motel, the TV series. And I think she was conflicted because she was self-righteous. She really does think what she's doing is right. And she had such a problem with Renera because she thinks Renera, cover your ears, people, is a whore. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because mm -hmm. she you know for logical reasons thinks she slept outside of her marriage which that was a Renera's marriage was very interesting yeah i mean look this is my theory it yeah. has not been proved yet because we haven't seen anything but it seems pretty obvious to me that they faked the death of her husband what do you mean it was seen did you miss it what what do you mean yeah then he went out on the boat he sh it was shaved his head very, and left. yeah it was a very oh. very short scene oh, where right. you see a guy I like have looked away oh, you oh, no look at your imdb <laughs> no What's the how long is this episode no this is what happened How many episodes? and also is super end? dark it was like he was running out no, at pre-dawn you could see it and but you knew who he was so a guy was sort of running along the shore jumps in a boat i mean man He's going to live a pauper life. He didn't have anything with him. I was like, damn. And he shaved off the blonde oh locks. Oh, my God. Now I remember. You're right. Shaves off the blonde locks and gets oh. on the boat. So they did not kill him, which I like. But then I hope his there's a moment. He's moving yeah. to live with his auntie and uncle in Bel Air. Oh, oh, yeah. oh God. He's the fresh prince. <laughs> the fresh prince. Uh, I mean, I do hope he has a moment where he comes back and it's like, dun, dun, dun. I know. It is ironic, though, that his mom 
thinks that they were complicit in complicit she thinks they ordered yeah, they, it they killed him and really what they did is let him escape to live a free life well because mm. he was homosexual yeah which mm-hmm. game of thrones had a very fluid sexuality it seemed to go a lot of different ways in those houses in the city little fingers uh yes. domain yeah, yeah. yeah. well in the brothels pl- you mean the pleasure house yes but to be a future queen's husband no that was not gonna be acceptable oh, yeah, you can't. and you're supposed to sire the future which they tried they I tried it didn't work so but from a very young age renera actually had eyes for her uncle and he had eyes for her which like like i said the incest was like holy yeah, crap a lot mm-hmm. so them getting together is now the power couple yeah and they end up having super blonde white haired kids i couldn't keep track of how many kids they've already had oh i they have three Um, they have because they lost that one but i don't don't know know. whatever they weren't at her crowning just the two brown haired kids were there anyway it was very satisfying i mean there was a lot going on yeah i i felt like actually you know a lot of eggs in the fire oh gosh (laughs) they left a lot of easter eggs but knowing it's not going to come back till 2024 it's like yeah i'm gonna need to basically watch the last couple episodes again to know where we're at yikes probably yeah because i always like the recap at the beginning oh you know what and i do want to bring up one thing there are a lot of manipulators right obviously mm -hmm. auto hightower creep yeah well one of just ooh, the one that make my skin crawl which means he did a great job, was Matthew Needham, that's the actor's name, was Lars Strongham. And he was really the in the ear of the queen who would be like, well, if you'd like this person dead. I know. He was really creepy. He had very little finger vibes, right? I oh, mean, like, he felt so like... so manipulative yeah. and so gross. Well, if you'd like this person dead, she'd be like, oh... And then that whole scene where she oh. take her shoes off and like, does he have a foot fetish? Like, what is happening uh, That here? is definitely yeah. what they oh, were saying. Oh my He's God. got a club foot and uh, because of that, he's like oh, anyone no. with straight feet. Perfect got my feet. Eye. Oh my Can god! I see? What ooh, True. stockings? Oh, it was stockings. Like, it was like the original OnlyFans. Oh, he was oh the my god! Only fan. <laughs> only fan of exactly. Feet. So yeah, I mean, I'm excited it's coming back, but it's sad to hear it's 2024. Yeah, I do want to say also that I'm sad that Lord Liam Beesbury oh. got oh. killed. I was like, what? I love this old dude. Speaking, Why do you got to kill him? Who didn't because age he had, the entire time. Well, because he well, had. He was um, already 80 when it yeah. started. He had not only dignity, but he also had integrity. Yeah, well. And when he was like, uh, this will not stand. This is baloney. The gosh, the, Sir Christian. He killed a inte- lot of people. He's a bad my, temper. Integrity, my butt. He was there the entire time that Hightower was there. The entire time. So he did nothing. He can die. That's fine. He oh, didn't. you're God, a pig. Oh, I don't know about he that. He nothing. No, I don't agree. He Go stood up in the end. And, <laughs> uh, and I did love Corliss, too. That was Princess Rainey's husband. Oh, right. Who, he was missing for a while. He was like, he was off fighting he was, a yeah. battle forever. And he was, six years. Take it easy. Six years. He was injured. But and, he was successful. I mean, I He wasn't guess. injured. He had like, he was sick. Oh, he was sick. I he, he, I definitely he was gravely injured. Gravely injured. Yeah. Gravely yeah. injured or Which gravely a, sick. It's or... a real specific way to say, he is <laughs> dying. Go home, please. Yeah. He comes back and he's just limping, but he's still got real attitude. <laughs> like, oh, okay. Yeah, I like their whole family and their whole vibe. I thought they were, you know, they came in with a lot of dignity. Like their daughter, God, her death scene. Because it also talked about the, the idea of how high risk giving birth is. Yeah. And it's terrible. so there's a whole mm-hmm. scene about, you know, a woman giving birth and because the baby was breech, it's pretty much actually it happens twice in this series and really ends up in the death of the, the mother. Mm-hmm. And in, in both cases, actually, the children die, too. But mm-hmm. I mean, just, you know, everything had to line up perfectly for these women to have like healthy babies. And there is a really dramatic scene. You know, one of the women decides to take control of the situation and her dragon partakes in it as well. Yep. And it's pretty fabulous. But you're like, this is really sad and scary. And oh my God. So, yeah. No, I mean, they, they hit like... They really packed it they in. They packed it in. episodes. They packed it in. you start thinking about it more. And you're like, gosh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That. So, satisfying, I think, is the way to put it. I think they did a great job. And it also felt like if you had not watched Game of Thrones, you would not have needed to. You yeah. could just start here. I mean, I couldn't even remember stuff from Game of Thrones that I was like, oh, am I supposed to know what that place is that they're talking about? Is that significant? Doesn't matter. Not really. No. Yeah. 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 So if you have not watched Game of Thrones, you can just still jump into this. 
All right. Well, let's put a pin in House of the Dragon Ed, for a year pun? and a half. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, you have another, another pun than that, but that works. Just yeah, a pause on it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So I just want to say that I did finish Reboot, mm. which is on uh. Hulu. Oh my gosh, what a fun series! Really, really super duper enjoyed it. I had mentioned it before, but it is by Stephen Levitan of Modern Family, among other things, but. But that's what a lot of people know him from. Stars Judy Greer, Rachel Bloom, Paul Reiser, Johnny Knoxville, Keenan Michael Key is fantastic in it. There's this incredibly funny relationship between Cullum Worthy and Krista Marie Yu. Oh, God, that is a really fun relationship that they developed. There's just so much. You said Paul Reiser, too, right? I did say Paul yeah, Reiser. I loved him in it. He's really good. And again, this is another ending of a season that was really yeah, I mean, different, satisfying, because it's a comedy, but really fun. So I feel like they left it in a good spot. A lot of good little storylines are like both tied up and then left Could open. Be, yeah. yeah. So up. really, really good. I really enjoyed it and recommend it. So I finished that. And then you will get a kick out of this, Liz. I did go back and I finished those two Netflix movies that I started. <laughs> 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 so I finished Lou. Which was the one with oh, Alice yeah. and Janney. God, she was really She's fantastic. She's so good. Yeah, it looked amazing. I, I mean, said they, d- you yeah. know, they really pulled out all the stops for what probably was never meant to be in the movie theaters, but I thought they did a great job. And she just weighted it with her professionalism and her craft. She oh, was she's awesome. so good. Yes. Oh yeah. my God, that scene in the end in the ocean. Holy moly. Yeah, there's a fight in the ocean that is like, are you kidding me? You couldn't like, have done that probably without the drone what? capabilities of today's filmmaking. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty spectacular. Yeah. Directed by Anne Forrester and just, I was going to say, fucking fantastic. And I'm going to say fucking fantastic. <laughs> but she did, Great of course, job. something that you all know is one of the things I hate. The characters had to be wet like 90% I mean, of the time. I mean, they really just were, would die. They were definitely dirty 90% of the time. And they were wet like 85% of the time. It was a lot. And I'm like, kudos to you. Just because I the shoot must have been so arduous for that reason. Yeah. I mean, and a really small cast and yeah. still a very engaging and good movie where there's like a lot of drama and mm. tension and action. Logan Michael Green was really great. Journey Smollett was really great. It was very good. Your friend, Matt Craven, from mm. playing Play golf, golf with... your one time. Yes. Good friend. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, finished that and then also finished... Luckiest Girl Alive, oh, yeah. the Mila Kunis movie. That was really enjoyable, too. Yeah. So, you know, Netflix, it's interesting. The idea that, like, here's some Netflix movies that aren't going to be in the theater. But, you know, they're really high quality. And you mm-hmm. wonder, you know, what's the future going to be? I mean, look, I want Netflix movies and I want theatrical releases. Oh, yeah, because there's yeah. things coming mm-hmm. up like Wakanda Forever. I mean, I'm so excited to see in the movie theater. But then, I don't know if you saw the trailer for the new Guardian Galaxy, the, the Christmas thing. I, I like, oh my, am yeah. dying. Kevin Bacon, like, I cannot wait. Yeah. So, yes, there's we've got to be able to figure out a balance in this industry. Right, because I don't want it to be just huge blockbuster. No, I want, attempts, as yeah. Nicole Kidman says, I want to go to the theater and have the experience. <laughs> so I want to go. So don't take it away from us. No, 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 no. Well, in the meantime, Luckiest Girl Alive on Netflix, very good. Mila Kunis, great job. The whole yeah. cast, very good. It looked really good. The mm-hmm. story was very interesting and engaging. It had a very Me Too quality right. going on in and there. The in the story. Yeah. yeah, and then, yeah, and the young woman who played her in the high school, she <sighs> was so good. Yeah, God, tell you one of the worst nights ever. What goes down with her? Uh, yeah, that was hard to watch when yeah. you realize what's unfolding. And yeah. I gotta say, Connie Britton also playing a very oh unlikable. My God. She was really good. I mean, you're really you know like, what I like you're about terrible. her mm-hmm. because she kind of played a unsophisticated woman that gets thrust into now. She's got to act like she can hang with this, you know, 
back east upper crust society crowd well, and she was aspiring when the girl was a teenager she was like trying knew, to like, like elevate yeah. if i put you in this school around these type of people it will elevate your life and then you have her on like a white lotus where she's you know the very opposite where it's supposed to be totally the epitome of sophistication yeah connie britain's amazing she yeah didn't so do the range is good yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah still just you know the hair does not change but you know the character it's funny. does yeah it's funny because in she did have different colored hair like at one point she has like dark dark hair when the girl's in high school and you're like oh yeah she's trying to work out her look it was a good character all right so somebody else can go well i've got uh one review something that somebody else already reviewed one (laughs) catch-up and then three more things to talk the about. From the 80s, knowing okay. you, what? I mean, what is happening So here? Uh, Maybe we don't need to the, talk about everything. The review is one of the three catch-ups. So oh, okay. it's a crossover. Mm-hmm. So we're going to do the, uh, I finished watching Ghostbusters Afterlife. Oh, good job. The second half. Mm-hmm. Super fun. Uh, back end of that. And of course, my, my suspicions were right. Uh, I knew which Ghostbuster she was related to. It was great to figure that out early on. I think I took a note like in the first 10 minutes. I'm like, oh, I think this is happening. I think that's happening take a little note oh great those are paying off ultimately a really fun ending to the movie although kind of opening the door to more of the ghostbusters franchise well, good for them. that's so smart i'm excited yeah. about that because that one had bill murray and dan Aykroyd, a send up to harold ramus paul rudd who seems to be in friggin everything paul rudd he's um, so good. and then a younger yeah. generation so mm-hmm. yeah we watched it because that was only 2021 it was fun I remember watching it with my kid. It's on stars. But it won't be forever. That kind of thing. It's but not if like you stars. Have stars. Made of. <laughs> it's made of stars. We're all made of stars. Okay. All right. All uh, right. So that was just catching you up on all the Ghostbusters movies that I right. watched. I finished watching them like that night, probably. And now, now that we're on theme for the Ghostbusters, oh. I can get into the three things that I am bringing to the podcast. One of which is a review of Studio 666. You may be oh. starting to see a theme with my viewing. <laughs> um, that was not my cup of tea per usual a scary movie, but it was a, it was such a campy scary movie that I could really enjoy like all the all the attempts at scaring me and getting me with a, a big moments or whatever. No, didn't get me. It was I mean, very enjoyable. I watched yeah. it during the daytime. It's very easy to not be scared. Just to remind people that is a movie I actually saw in the movie theaters. Yep. It is a horror comedy from this year, 2022. Also, I think is available on Stars. Uh, yes. And it is The Foo Fighters. I think Dave Grohl produced it. Might have also been one of the writers on it. But, uh, you know, it's their sort of very homage, can't be send up of horror flicks. So. Yeah, weren't they making an album in a house and thought this is kind of a spooky house yeah. let's make a movie about that <laughs> pretty much that they <laughs> that's funny i don't think there was an actual haunting while they're making an album i think it was more like inspired by a creek yeah. in a bedroom somewhere that they were like that is going to be in the album now because that thing creaks every time we walk past it uh, oh, yeah. haunted, you know, album. haunted mansion is what this was it was sort of you can't take any of it seriously but no yeah i mean taylor hawkins god bless his soul was in it and it was very good and fun and uh the entire band was in it so yeah amazing and right in time for the end of the uh halloween season Mm -hmm. so since we'd already reviewed that i knew i was going to get into that very deep the next two one is kind of short but it is a marvel studios short film although like you know 50 minutes long called werewolf by night oh i'm oh, trying I saw to keep promos for that super up to date on my marvel because there's about to be some movies coming out and now that i've caught up on everything because i could i'm like okay what's the newest thing this one for this month all right fine mm-hmm. play black and white all right you're doing you're trying to go for a filmy thing oh something's in color okay so one particular thing in this entire thing is in color and oh that's going in a totally different direction ah that's fun it's funny there's a funny part to this i thought it was gonna be serious and scary and it is not serious and scary well it's not disney plus no but but like marvel can still try to do some bad villains Uh and some scary stuff and this is like werewolf uh so you're thinking maybe scary werewolf story no it's fine it's very enjoyable and although there is a werewolf transformation in it and it is not um it's not great outcome for everybody that's involved in that. Uh, you'd still probably enjoy watching the entire thing anytime. It's not particularly Halloweeny, 
but it is falling in line with a couple of the other TV franchise stuff that they're introducing. Good cast. Yeah. Now I want to watch this because I've seen the promos for it, but I didn't really understand what it was, but it's on Disney. I mean, Laura Donnelly, who I love from Outlander. She's great. And Harriet Harris is a great character actress. Man, she's been around a long time and did some really fun stuff. So, and then actually the um, lead. Gail Garcia Bernal. Yeah. I mean, don't tell me who the werewolf is. I, but I mean, there's I, only. I won't say anything. I mean, listed it. is only. It's a very small cast. Yes. Yeah. No. It's the really small. Like it's essentially a uh, a bottle episode where it's oh. just these people in a small environment and no one can come in or out. So there's almost not even extras. Hmm. There's probably mm-hmm. uh, twenty times the actual crew that there were. Cast oh, probably. Oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah. So ultimately, it's a it's a bit of a mystery who's doing what and who's hiding the secret. And then uh, once that's revealed, unravels or unfolds, you do get a uh, a very good um, comeuppance for someone that you may feel like needs it. So, oh, you know, if you're, if you're watching and you're like, oh, I don't like that character, I suggest you finish watching. They may get what they deserve. Mm. All right. And the last thing that I was bringing, which I did not have any idea what I was going into with this. I It's not like I'm a fan of Rob Zombie's music, but... I decided to go ahead and fire up The Monsters. Uh, oh, the by new Rob one? Zombie, the brand new one. Oh, which and is focused on Wednesday, right? No, Wednesday oh. Adams is... Uh, the- actually, I do want to put that out there, that that's coming out next month. I looked for it now, because I thought it would be timely oh. for Halloween. It is coming out in a month at, so for Thanksgiving. So that's The Adams Family. The Adams oh, Family. Wednesday right. Adams on yeah, Netflix. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and that's by Tim Burton. By oh, Tim Burton, my right. Gosh. Easily confused, those two I just families did. and those yeah, shows back in the did. day. Okay. This is The Monsters with Rob Zombie. And our dad was in one episode of the original series i'm like oh yeah i've watched the show and it's, it has been a minute since i've watched the monsters y'all i forgot the wackiness of a 60s sitcom they did not update it it is uh, a, a oh. full color new cast completely wacky mm. 60s sitcom and it took me like the first half an hour to get on board with it but essentially, it was almost like a three or four part mini series prequel to the actual series. If you know the Munsters, there's Herman Munster, Lily Munster, and Grandpa Munster. And in the TV series, Eddie Munster and their right. cousin that comes to visit, the, like the normal looking one. And they're already living in 1313 Mockingbird Lane. That's not what happens in this one. It's a prequel. Eddie doesn't exist. They just meet. Herman and Lily, they start dating and get married. They have to move out of their castle and move into 1313 Mockingbird Lane. I'm like, what are you doing? (laughs) And on top of that, the wackadoodle, like everyone in Transylvania is cool with there being like actual vampires and a count that's been alive for 200 years. And there's a scientist who makes Herman Munster, the Frankenstein monster in this town. So you just are signing on for like the whole world at that point. Wait, did you say where you can watch this? It's on Netflix. The upshot of all that is I've been a fan of the Munsters and the new Herman Munster does a great job. I could not pick any of the actors because they solidly did all the makeup the way you know from color photographs from the Munsters. Mm -hmm. The Munsters being black and white, I don't know if most people know this about movie makeup back in the days. The color photos that you see of monsters back in the days, Frankenstein monsters are green isn't because they were dead skinned green monsters it's because green makeup looked better in black and white than standard black and white you looked super pale or you had some really dark shadows and deep tones going on but it was black and white so no one could tell however color photos you look like a green giant (laughs) like what is going on (laughs) so they kept all the color so everybody looked the same and he's wearing the giant boots and he's got the goofy grin and he's making an effort to do the original Herman Monster laugh I was good with all of it. It was great. Nice. Um, I mostly don't have any of the other characters from the series in my brain, so I didn't have it to fight on anyone in my brain on the way they were playing the characters. Lily was great. The actor who played the Count, uh, Daniel Roebuck, totally recognizable and was the only actor that I'm like, yep, I know who that is. Everybody else, phew, good job. You nailed it. I don't know who you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but the two leads, Lily and Herman, Sherry Moon Zombie and Jeff Daniel Phillips, They both did a great job reinvigorating these characters, especially if you're going to go full camp 60s version of it and not update anything and not really give us like the heads up that you're doing a prequel to the entire television series before they're even married and have their kid killing me. I wish I didn't know that going in, man, that would have been a whole different ride. Um, And it will be a fun ride the next time I watch it now that I know what I'm getting into. All right. So those were my three 
timely references to the Halloween theme. Uh, three different things I brought to the podcast, and I hope you watch them. Nice. Before next year. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, John, you want to go? I'll do a quick one. Ed and I also watched Werewolves Within. Oh, my God. I watched that, too. It's funny. Was when he was talking fun. about the short film, I was like, God, that kind of reminds me of Werewolves Within. Sorry. Go ahead, John. Yes. Yeah, so it's super fun. Uh, I mean, it's from 2021. I didn't catch it whenever it came out, wherever it came out. But now it's in various places. And it was incredibly fun to watch. I mean, I don't know. Oh, I... I saw this. Oh, great. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I caught it accidentally from the middle. Like it was on HBO or something. And this is a very Catherine thing to do. Be sure. like, wait, what is this? It's the AT&T girl, Lily, who is starring in this movie. What movie right. is this? Yeah, Melania Von Trub. Uh She is so good. Oh, yeah. great. Um, She's fantastic. Yeah. I mean... You know, there's definitely some plot twists that you don't see coming. Yes, I mean, I you're <laughs> constantly waiting. You're like, well, no, the movie's going to go this way. Mm, now I think the movie's going to go this way. Now I think it's going to go this way. It was unexpected, which it, whenever that happens, it's really enjoyable because you're like, oh, I didn't. OK, no, I, I was unprepared. I didn't. I'm incorrect. So that's uh, yeah. quite fun. Sam Richardson, as always, a oh, delight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you kind you're. You start with like, oh, is this going to be classic Sam Richardson? And then you're like, oh, uh, yeah. And then we're like, well, maybe it'll go. No, it's going to it's going to stay in the classic Sam. This is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was great. Yeah, because I actually the plot focuses around him because he basically is the new guy in town. He comes in as the new forest ranger, Finn, if I remember correctly. And the postal worker, Cecilia, is showing him around town and it's like, or giving him the insight or the scoop. And it's like, I mean, talk about a job that he thought would not be that hard in this small, sleepy town. And admit it goes very wrong. And, you know, I do love a, you know, small, confined cast for various reasons. A big storm was coming in. So oh, yeah, we, that's we why leave. when you were saying it was like a bottle episode of this other werewolf thing, which is the other thing that reminds <laughs> me of this. I'm like, what? <laughs> I got to tell you, this small group and they basically all get stuck in this one hotel. The lessons to be learned from this episode, people, are if you are a werewolf, do not get cast into a bottle episode. It's going to go <laughs> badly for you. Oh, my gosh. The screenplay was written by Mishna Wolf. Whoa. Oh, that's what is cool. going on here? <laughs> So uh, yeah. I do have to call out my two favorite people in that entire movie, George Basil and Sarah Burns playing Marcus and Gwen, the white trash uh, car owning mechanic in town. They were like, what is happening with those two? They, they were did fantastic. not get a script. All right. You just to got told what your characters are and improv for the entire three months of shooting. That's great. Good yeah, job. George Basil Maybe. is fantastic. He's popped up in a couple of things <laughs> yes. like he was on Wrecked. I can't remember what well, else. I think the most important thing is he's not Kyle Mooney. But on the other hand, he's just as enjoyable. There was a lot of cast in this that was great. I mean, yeah, it was just a small town vibe and being forced to be together to try to survive at a certain point was just very enjoyable. And yes, there were twists and turns that kind of shocked you, which was very fun. And I'm a screamer, so I definitely screamed once or twice as well. I think I fully had myself convinced it was going to be a hot fuzz style. Uh, the whole town's in on it. Oh. And then it was not. In case you do watch this, I've spoiled that not nah. actual plot for you. Yeah, <laughs> Can you God. not spoil something? <laughs> yeah, like, I don't know that I was thinking that. But yeah, no, it's just, it's it's actually very fun. It came out in 2021. But just in time for Halloween, you should go back and watch it. Right. And uh, one last call out, cast-wise, Harvey Gulen from what we do in the shadows oh, oh my yeah. god i i mean like i love him, him and i'll watch him in anything yeah so. him opposite cheyenne jackson yeah they were a very cute couple mm -hmm. they were married oh, and their yeah. last names mm -hmm. was wolfson what oh yeah. my god that's hysterical i think and some of these clues were what was leading at a strike because i mean even the writer you know getting that credit you're like well all right what's happening no that was that was fantastic <laughs> that's how you should be doing movies people put a lot of clues that lead us nowhere stop giving <laughs> us the freaking answer in the trailers well Anyways. i mean a lot of times that's what a trailer does all right liz what do you got yeah so i just have two things i'll go over pretty quickly uh the series the sinner which oh is I re yeah airing on netflix right now it's season four Four. It's produced by Jessica Biel, and she was in the first season, and the seasons are named after 
usually one of the lead primary characters. So Cora was season one, which was Jessica Biel. I've watched all of them. Matt Bomer was season three, Jamie, which was awesome. And this is season four, which is Percy. The primary character is played by Bill Pullman, the detective Harry Ambrose is his character's name, who, you know, usually gets thrust into some psychological... There is usually a vibe of sinister... I want to say otherworldly elements. Mm -hmm. And then it's usually not that, but it plays with your mind. And he has to unravel the case. Right. So really strong cast with this one. And it takes place in a small town that, you know, there's so many secrets, you know. Oh, secrets. So this one is in Maine. And, you know, it's a fishing community and it's very tight-knit. And there is a family that um, sort of runs the fishing community in town. And I don't want to give spoiler alerts because it's very new. Like you can watch it right now on Netflix, but the Muldoons and Percy Muldoons Muldoon is okay. what this season is named after. So she's the focus. Her grandmother is played by Frances Fisher, who is like a master class. Oh, in acting. she's she, always amazing. Yeah. You, she does so many nuanced choices that you think you oh okay she knew or she's guilty or she's manipulating it's like oh maybe she's not she is she's not she is woo tap dance and bill pullman his character is very complex because he has his own childhood trauma that he sort of carries throughout the string and maybe this is why he relates to the victims the way he does and he has a fixation he cannot let You know, there are a lot of times like you should let this case go. You should not be pursuing this. Like it is a detriment to your health, to his current partner in this played by Jessica Heck, which is Sonia. And she was actually part of season three and had a really interesting twisty turn involvement in season three, which is called Jamie and Matt Bomer. So stunningly gorgeous in that. And she carries over to season four because now they're partners but the toll that his relentless pursuit of a case takes on their relationship. Ah, It is mm -hmm. beautifully shot. Bill Pullman is fantastic in it. Mm -hmm. You know, he just always seems uncomfortable. Like he's, you know, he's never at peace. He is always, you know, searching for uncomfortable in his own skin. I mean, he does such a good job of that that you're just, you feel for him. You know, you have empathy for him. I'm like, oh my gosh, Bill, (laughs) I don't know what you mean. What is going on that you made some of these choices, but it's so fantastic. And it's always like the layers of the get revealed in the way they tell the story is unexpected. And you think it's going one direction and it's not. And it's well worth it. I mean, listen, if you have not watched, it's called The Sinner. If you've not watched any of the seasons, I mean, I highly, Jessica Bills produced all of them. It started in the first season. She was fantastic in it. And that one was disturbing, creepy, and kind of the slow reveal of the case and the characters throughout Bill Pullman trying to solve it is just mesmerizing so they're all standalone in a way so it's sort of an anthology but bill pullman as the detective follows. yes yeah and he does have an arc of you know what happens in season three has a huge impact on season four so i would say watch all the way through but you know you could just drop in slash if you see bill pullman's character coming into your town maybe leave before something <laughs> gets oh. found out about you real quick. Maybe, maybe. yeah it's usually not it's not gonna be a good thing, you know, but uh, like I said, beautifully shot. I don't know if they actually shot in Maine. It's see, it sure seemed like it. I mean, so um, I highly recommend it. And Bill Pullman was fantastic. And I don't, you know, he's one of those people that's like not an awards darling. Right. And I don't know. Shout out Netflix. Submit he him. He should be. He should be. So it would be nice if he was um, considered. But that does seem to be not what's happening. So, yeah. So, Sinner Season 4 on Netflix right now. And every season is eight episodes. But they're an hour long. So, I have stayed up. Like, I'm not going to watch another one. I'm not going to watch another one. I don't stop it. And it's literally, 
I'm up to, I, I have been in. up till two or three in the morning. Uh, unfortunately, you are catching up. This did air last year on USA, but right now it's on Netflix. Boom. Okay. So the other thing I watched was the documentary Nothing Compares on Showtime about Sinead O'Connor. Yes, I watched it too. Fan. Fantastic, 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 fantastic. Um, inspiring, heartbreaking, yep. enraging, um, yep. enlightening. Um, it made you go like, my God, follow your passion, people, and be damned the cost because in the end you have integrity for it. What a unicorn yeah. she was. Yeah. I mean, so ahead in her activism, number one, mm-hmm. her sense of singing. And she says this was therapy. It was her way of screaming. Yeah. And it was cathartic for her. And it was never about money or success, but her talent just took it on that train. It was undeniable. And her fashion sense, just the way she presented herself. I mean, there are pictures of her that are, you know, 20, 30 years old, you're like that could be in vogue today, the way she styled and presented herself. You know, shaving her head, people first thought that might be like related to like neo Nazism or something like that. And it was more like stripping away because the record label wanted her to be like a glamorous pop yeah, star. Yeah, they wanted her to be girly. And it yeah. talks about, ironically, the same thing I just talked about with the center, like childhood trauma mm-hmm. and her relationship with her mother. And Ireland and the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. And they did such a beautiful job. The entire movie was voiced over by her mm-hmm. and other people in her life, but it was all archival or a few reenactments, but by an actress portraying her, but almost from the back or the side or yeah, never obscured in some obscured. way. So you could so go on this like beautiful artistic narrated version of her life. And my God. God, was she articulate. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Smart. I mean, that she survived her circumstances to come out and strive and really, you know, never be like pushed over and really take on causes. And so when she first performed the Grammys, Public Enemy was not performing because of the Grammys were not recognizing rap as a category. Right. So mm-hmm. they boycotted it. So she came out and sang this song just, you know, just the way she carried herself, just by herself. You know, she said Stevie Wonder was in the front row. Quincy Jones. Incredible. She had painted Public Enemy's like logo, logo or, yeah. on the mm-hmm. side of her head. And they actually have the lead singer talk about it. He's like, I knew that was like genuine. That wasn't like putting on something because actually she has a lot of roots that she ties Rastafarian history and Ireland together, sort of Mm -hmm. oppressed by the Catholic church, by the crown, Mm -hmm. by circumstances, by the government. So, you know, she comes out at like 19 years old. Yeah. And becomes like a worldwide phenomenon by the age of like 20 and becomes a mother as well. And um, marries her longtime boyfriend is with him with quite a few years at that point, too. And she just leads her life with such integrity. Mm -hmm. And they come in on the famous image and story of Saturday Night Live, where she tears the image of the Pope. But knowing more of the backstory, because I said, I go, I knew she did that. And I was like, oh, I mean. John Paul II was a very popular pope. But unbeknownst to us, you know, the rumblings of the crisis of what was happening in the Catholic Church with hiding for decades, if not centuries, the sexual abuse that took place in the church. Right. She basically decided to make a stand on that. And listen, there was also in Ireland, there was also the history of young girls getting pregnant and being put in these this home with nuns. The Sisters of Magdalena, I think. I might be mispronouncing that. Yeah, the laundries. Oh my mm-hmm. God. But the history of that suppression of young women and just women in general in Ireland and how really the Catholic Church put a foot down on people's freedom in Ireland for, you know, centuries. So when she got up and tore that picture of the Pope, Me being, you know, an 18 year old going, I don't really get that. She was canceled. You know, we we call cancel culture today. She was canceled. She was canceled. And when in actuality, uh, she was completely right. She was super right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it wasn't proven till years. I mean, she was almost 
driven to insanity trying to hold on to her integrity and her truth at a huge cost. Mm -hmm. And you just realize what an artist she was and ahead of her time. And I cannot recommend it enough. Also, her songs, like you kind of have forgotten about them. The, you know, the song Nothing Compares to You, which is, you know, has become one of those songs that will probably last them until music you know, no longer exists in the world, you know, which is hopefully never. But, you know, it's just one of those songs. And they never played it which up until the end i was like this how is so are we not weird how are we yeah. not hearing it but mm -hmm. they're talking about it and referencing and they actually never even say prince wrote it and she recorded it and it became this huge phenomenon it's because prince's current who estate, estate, estate management or whatever would not allow it and you're like what in the f but i there's a story because she actually did talk about meeting prince after the song was a huge hit and <laughs> she said it was a really weird meeting we ended up having like a pillow fight and he scolded me for cursing in my interviews and so on and so forth so she didn't like speak about him in, in this you know holding him high up so maybe maybe they're pissed about that still i'm not sure but it seemed like such an odd choice I to mean, be like it seems crazy it's such a well-known song oh, because of her performance yes it and that like, music yeah. video mm -hmm. but there's all these other songs that just you go oh my gosh yeah that's such a great song it's so good and and then the very sort of last piece of the documentary is her now currently performing this beautiful song mm -hmm. it's repetitive lyrics but the way she interprets them is so beautiful and her voice is still strong and like you know there's a courage to it there's a survivor element to it like yeah. you have not been able to kill me she has one of the greatest quotes when she said they tried to bury me, what they didn't know was I was a seed. Oh, God, that's a great yes! one. Yes! You're yeah. like, God, God love you. I just found the whole thing so empowering is because I felt like you knew the story. Yeah. You felt like you knew her, but guess what? You don't. It is so worth it. It's called Nothing Compares to You, the director, Catherine Ferguson. Huge kudos to her because I love the archival element to it. And the cinematographer, Luke Jacobs, the editor, I got to say, you know, often we don't call it the editor, which is ironic since yeah, there's editors in our family. Yeah, in the room, yeah. But uh, Mick Moyham did just such a good job because, like I said, it was all this archival footage. Some of the interviews, the condescending, misogynistic interviews that she had to endure with the British like oh, yeah. was mm -hmm. but she navigated it beautifully mm -hmm. and you know I will say it talks about th that childhood trauma that she experienced with her mother who was mentally ill really I, I think it can speak to so many people generationally too yeah. so mm -hmm. I cannot highly recommend it enough so I will once again say it is nothing compares um, and you can watch it on Showtime and I also did The Sinner which all seasons are available on Netflix right now and that was season four, the most yes, current Yes, that I watched, yes. Well, I will make one last comment about Nothing Compares to You. On Showtime, which obviously, again, I flipped through channels, I started watching it in the middle. Mm. And it took me a while to realize that they weren't showing anyone that they were doing the interviews yeah, all with. voiceover. Yes. So, I mean, I had just thought, like, oh, maybe they showed them at the beginning. And I just missed that whole part. So then I, of course, like, set it up to record or I went to On Demand or however I then watched it from the beginning. And I was like, oh, stylistically. Loved it. It's all photos and archival, both concerts and interview clips from different things that she was doing at the time. And then her contemporary voiceover as as well it was incredibly well constructed right for how they decided to do it the funny thing is i also then watched the cheryl crow documentary oh. i won't talk about that now it is very good okay but to watch two very Contrast. different approaches yeah and both music documentaries and just you know the whole issue of mental illness that she addresses and oh yeah, yeah. it's just it's so well it's done. so good it's yeah. really good yeah so i wasn't gonna bring it up i was gonna hold it till next week but nothing compares to you yes very very good on showtime okay then i did a catch-up we talked about the finale of house of the dragons all of us mm -hmm. and then i caught up on finishing up the movie lou on netflix and also the movie luckiest girl in the world also on Netflix. <laughs> and I think that's all I talked about. Did I talk about anything else? <laughs> it was so long ago now. Reboot. <gasps> oh, that's right. And I finished Reboot, which 
was super, super fun. And if you haven't watched it, get on it. It's real, real fun. And that's on Hulu. Okay, so that's me. All right. And then I watched The Munsters, the new movie on Netflix, and Werewolf by Night on Disney Plus, and Studio 666 on Stars. All on theme for the holiday. <laughs> and Ed and I watched Werewolves Within. And apparently we all watched it. Yeah. yeah. Currently on Showtime. Love it. All right. Well, thank you all for listening to what we are watching. And please join us on all of our social media at Podcast Watching. Okay. Thank you for listening to What, what We Are, are watching. watching.